And you say, Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, I want to please you. As I was going through my daily devotion, I've spent some more time on Colossians. And this is, I think, message number four or five of the series on Colossians. I keep discovering gems, little things that means to me something when I do my devotion. So I just felt to take some of these and bring uh, to you. Verse number one, we're going to look this morning. For this reason, we have not stopped praying for you. Since the day we heard about you, asking that you may be filled with the full knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. For this reason, there's a reason, and this reason connects us with what has been said, spoken previously. If you have your Bible, you see that's the advantage to bring your own Bible or to look at your text because me, I'm only putting verse 8. But now I'm telling you that I am referring to the previous verse. So if you only look here, you will not see it. But if you have it on, in your hand, then you can check, check what I'm saying. So uh, the preceding verse, it means that Epaphras has come back to Paul Paul was in prison, and he gave him a report. Hey, did you know in Colossians, we have a new brothers and sisters. They just received the Lord. They have believed the message of the gospel. They are saved. They have faith. And then from the time that Paul heard about them, he and his companions, and there is a list of names and companions, the book of Colossians. Paul is not alone. Uh, <laughs> Timothy is around, and other people are with him. Epaphras is there. They just go on their knees and, and intentionally they start to pray for this new group of believers. They, they really pray, you know, and to me it means something special because it is actually a very important but unfortunately neglected principle of discipleship. You know, Jesus says, go make disciples. So the first thing about disciples, if you are going to make a disciple, would be when you know that they have received the gospel and received Jesus as Savior, pray for them. That's the first thing that we should all be doing as a church. Like when we support our churches, for example, in the Philippines, we should pray. Pray for these church. Pray for the work. When you know that there is a project, a mission project like I listed before, go to prayer intentionally and pray specifically for them. So that's what Paul and his companions began praying. And this is really important. And this prayer is filled with words of abundance. Uh, for example, uh, we have not stopped praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the full knowledge, filled with all spiritual or all kinds of spiritual understanding and wisdom. And then in the following verse, you will have words that will be fully pleasing, every good work, uh, all power and all patience and long suffering. So he's really praying for the full, for the full package, for the blessing, for, for a, a, gen a generous prayer that he's praying for these people. And that is an example for us. In verse, in verse 10 here, that, that's the part that I want to pay a bit of attention and that when I was doing my devotion, I was stopped by this, this line here. So that, and now you, you find a little bit of the detail of the prayer. So that is the purpose, the, the heart of Paul toward these new believers. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Here I have broken these into the different, uh, four different things that he is really asking about them. So, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, number one. Number two, that you will please him in every way. Your life will be pleasing to the Lord. Number three, that you will keep on bearing fruit and every kind of actions or work or the di different things. And that you will keep on growing in the knowledge of the Lord. Another Bible version says that you will be able to live as the Lord wants. Pleasing to the Lord. Worthy of the Lord. And always do what pleases Him. 
This is a very important connection between verse 10 and verse 9. Why did the Apostle Paul want the Colossians to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, with the, with the full knowledge of the Lord, with wisdom, with understanding uh, the, the knowledge of the Lord? That's, that's one question we want to answer uh, this morning. Was it that they will become super preachers? That they will have a lot of followers? That they will become popular TV preachers? No, that's not for that. The real purpose of Paul's prayer for spiritual wisdom and understanding is to enable them and us this morning to walk worthy of the Lord. That you and I will live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And that is worthy of what the Lord has done for us. You remember in previous studies of Colossians, he has rescued us, he has delivered us, he has transported us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom the Son he loves, he has forgiven us, you know, we are now reconciled with God. And all the things that Jesus has done on the cross through his broken body, through dying, through his blood, through his suffering. So this is really important for us. And it gives us a lesson about guidance. You know, we often talk about guidance, how to know God's will. But do we appropriate the meaning of it in the right way? Do you want to be guided for what? Should I buy this or sell that? Should I turn right or turn left? Here, there's a much bigger picture that we are looking at. God does not reveal his will to us only to satisfy our curiosity or ambition or just to make us feel good. It's, it's bigger than that. You know, when you and I grasp the big picture, the plan of God, in a better way, his plan of redemption, his heart for the nation, his heart for leading people to, uh, re, uh, re, to be reconciled with him. We won't limit God to our human experience, our limited human experience. We are so limiting. We limit God so much in our prayers, in our visions, in our walk with God. And Paul is telling, I pray that you will expand your understanding of God's will. Because this is when you get a clear, bigger picture of God's will, that you will be motivated to walk in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. You will make decisions. You will have new desire in your life to, to live according to the Lord. So we will not limit God in our own human experience, but we will want to seek to please Him. The will of God... Listen to that. The will of God, knowing the will of God, is part of a successful uh, Christian life. It's a very, very important. God wants us to know his will. We read that in the book of Acts, chapter 22. God wants us to know his will. God wants us to understand his will. And Ephesians chapter 5 says, discern the will of the Lord. Understand the time, understand the will of the Lord. So that's important. God wants his children to understand his will. Also John and his prayer, uh, chapter 15, 15 says, But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. We are friends. We are chosen by God. So God wants us to understand what he is about, what he's about to do in these kind of things. So the more we will study the word of God and pray, we will always keep discovering new and exciting truths about God's will for us. And this is a pattern for a successful life. I want you to measure your life this morning, okay? Can you do that with me? Let's measure up with these four things. Do you recognize that in your life? Do I recognize these things? Are they really part of my life? If you would look at my life and analyze it and give me a score, 10 is plus and 0 is minus, how much would you give me, how much would I give you, and how much would you give to each other? Okay, can we do that? Okay, let's start with the very thing. Live a life worthy of the Lord. Are you living a life worthy of the Lord? Don't answer me, answer yourself. 
Okay, because it doesn't really matter, you know, to me, whatever I think. It's what the Lord thinks, you know. So what does that mean? If you remember months ago, Pastor Jennifer made a very good explanation of that uh, text uh, uh, when she was speaking. She talks about worthy of the Lord. It should be in balance with what the Lord has done for you. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember that, but it, it, stick, it stick with me. It should <coughs> correspond to what Christ has done for you. What has he done for you? Has he done enough? Has he done a little? Has he given just, you know, has he lived his life for you in a half-hearted way? Or did he give his all for you and for me? Did he die on the cross for you? Did, 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 did he deserve to die? Why did he do it? He did it out of love. When we were still sinner, Christ died for us. So to live a life worthy of the Lord means corresponding. My life should correspond. My way of life, my commitment, my devotions, my obedience, my faith, my surrendering, my actions should be dominated by this fact, should be measured in terms of Christ has done so much for me. I have to give my best to him. Do you agree with that? Amen. Yeah, not only a few of you agree. I thought you would all agree with that, but okay, let's say you do, but you did not answer. We say that we are not our own, that we were bought with a price. So in Romans chapter 2 it says, we have offered our body as living sacrifice. That is the only acceptable act of worship that we can do. There's nothing that is... Uh, that we can do, that we can offer, that we can uh, to God accept to give ourselves to the Lord. So we live a life worthy of the Lord. Number two, when you think about your, your way of life, your actions of every day, things like this, uh, fully pleasing to Him. Is that, is that what you, our life describes? The great goal of our life. That's the goal of our life. When we will see the Lord, would be well done. You know, that, that's what Jesus says. The ser faithful servant will hear, well done, faithful servant. You have been good. You've been obedient. You live by faith. You, you know, I gave you so many talents. You multiplied it. So come and, and rejoice with your master. So well done, the great goal of our life. Actually, we are not supposed to mind what other people think so much about us. Of course, we want to live, we live in society. You don't want to be too offensive to people. We want to live in a friendly manner and things like this. We make mistakes on these ones, but we, we are trying to, to grow in this. But actually, we're not to mind exactly what people approve. Because if the Lord does not approve then whatever man approve means nothing. Is that right? So that is really important that we seek to please him and everything. And that is the, another point that we will come back to a bit later. Bearing fruit in every good works. Okay, how rich are we in good works? Are we intentional? Do we think about it? Do we pray about it? Do we seize opportunity? Good works can be, if you look at the, uh, the terminology, in every good work or all good works. So this means that there is all sorts of good works that could be done over here. Uh, bear fruit by doing all kinds of good things. Here, if we talk about the productivity of a Christian, it should be marked by consistency. The productivity or the fruitfulness should be consistent. You know, look at the, at the tree. A tree produces fruit one year, but the next year it produces again, and the next year again. And the tree grows, its strong grow, its height increase, its, 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 its di the, the diameter will increase. The tree keeps on growing and bearing, and it the, the, will have more shadows. A tree keeps on growing. So you and I in our lives should be 
growing and fruitfulness. So that is bearing fruit, keeping on bearing fruit in all sorts of, of ways. It's really, uh, someone says, do not pick and choose. Oh, I like this ministry or I like to do this because I will be rewarded or looked at or praised or something like that. You know, I've worked with people in church before in Canada. I remember a situation when I, I think about that. And there was someone who wanted to be in the ministry, but he was picking and choosing. Well, one time we were going to have a, a, a song, and he didn't want to sing that song because he didn't have the good musician to go along. So he says, let this other guy sing the song instead. So he always looked for the, the best to be seen and, and, and the best. So he said, don't pick and choose, but whatever God has put in your way, like, like you, you do it. Also think about like this, and this description is, look at it like a, as a wheel, like a, a circle that, that goes. You grasp a, f a good understanding of God's will. The Holy Spirit revealed to you God's will. Then you get a bigger picture of what God is doing. Then it leads you automatically to want to please the Lord and be active and bear fruits in all sorts of ways. That will bring us to number four, increasing in the knowledge of God. So as it is increasing as the tree I was talking about, fruitfulness should and, and, and increase. And as you are active in serving God, you develop a second kind of knowledge of God. You see, you can learn from God by uh, listening to a preaching, doing your daily devotion, reading the Bible, which is a normal way. We learn many things. We learn doctrines. We learn about the character and the attributes of God. It's like you go to university and you do your degree in engineering or something like this. You, you are uh, empirical uh, learning knowledge. You, you pile up knowledge that you accumulate. But then when you, a doctor that has been spending five to seven years studying medicine, goes on to practice medicine and do a few surgeries and go to ER and go to the different departments during his internship and all this. He gets another kind of knowledge, a knowledge that is become from practical, and then he will accumulate memories of diagnostic, and then he will get better to find more delicate and more difficult or hidden uh, disease uh, and all this because he is now growing and, and experience on the job training he is discovering. So when you serve God, besides praying, besides reading the Bible, now you are active and bearing all sorts of good fruit. You want to serve God and pleasing him. You develop another kind, a practical knowledge of, Lord, of, of, of the Lord, which is very important experience. Someone says activity and goodness sharpens the knowing faculty. You do good things, it will sharpen your mind about the character of God, about the, the, the things that are important to the, to the, the, to the heart of God. Y you are learning another aspect of growing in the things of the Lord. And this becomes a cycle that you keep repeating. You learn more knowledge, the Holy Spirit reveals to you. You get more desire to please the Lord. You get more connected into seeking opportunities to serve the Lord. You get more knowledge of God. You grow. You keep on growing and you de develop uh, your, your discipleship uh, relation with the Lord. So, uh, Mr. Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers says, fruitful in every good work. And he gives this uh, example here. Have you the ability to preach? Preach. Uh, do you see a child, a little child that needs care? Care for him. Do, does a poor saint need uh, some food from your table? Send him food from your table. Let many acts of obedience, testimony, zeal, charity, all be found in your life. Do not select big things as your special good works, but glorify the Lord also in the little, fruitful, and every good works. That is really important. 
And then we move on in our prayers, because now we're talking about being strengthened with all power. Actually, we could read it, empowered with all power according to his glorious power. So that's a lot of power in that sentence here. And that is what uh, Paul is praying, that you and me will be empowered or strengthened with all might. And I want you to pay attention to the something in that sentence. What kind of power are we going to be strengthened with or empowered according to his glorious might. And if we look a little bit with the language that Paul is using, you will see over here, you will see the word dunamis, dunamo, or dunamis, and another word kratos, which has different words of power in the New Testament. The word dunamo or dunamis, I think you have heard many times people talking about that. It's like the dynamite or dynamo. We know that it produces electricity or it, it does something. It's efficient. But it's actually in the Bible mainly used for supernatural power, like a, a supernatural ability, like spiritual gift, for example, a gift of healing, things like that, miracles, things that God works in power. So it says you will be strengthened with that kind of power. You will be em empowered dunamu, with dunamis, power of the Lord. Okay? But it will be according to his glorious might. And you will see that this power, he used a different word, kratos, that is in the New Testament. It's an old Greek word, according to what I read, that is uh, talking only about, it's only applied about the Lord. It's like a perfect power, and it's a power that comes out of the glory of God, the majesty of God, the, the sovereignty of God, the all-powerful God. He can do everything. All things are possible. So this glorious God with his glorious plan, uh, Paul is asking that he will m empower you. But the, the funny thing, or if I, maybe funny is not the right word <laughs> for this one, but why did ba Paul want the Christian to have this power? And then you see it for all patience and suffering. So that's kind of a weird uh, sentence, because normally it says, talk about power, you want to talk about spiritual gift, healing, and then moving on, and all the glory, and the supernatural, and, uh, you know, the... the uh, lightning and thunders and you know all of these things but then it comes back to a very down to earth a place of humility it talks about you and I that we will be patient and long suffering so that must be important for us strengthening with all glorious might from the Lord so that we can walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. And that is also part of a pattern to measure up our lives and uh, in which we fail so much. Me, the first one. Why did Paul want the Christian to have his power? For patience and long suffering. The word patience here is meaning to remain under difficulties. It's like bearing a weight, uh, me, uh, remaining under the, the weight of difficulties without quitting, without surrendering. You just hold on there. You, you're patient. You, you, it's heavy, but you, you, you are going through that. And the other word uh, is more about uh, the power. It's, it has to do with people. And you are not retaliating. You are not seeking vengeance. You are not, you know, paying evil for evil. You are long-suffering. You can take a lot. So patient here has more to do with circumstance problem. And long-suffering has more to do with people's problem. And I don't know if you are, uh, I was reading something here. I don't know if I will find it, but it was somewhere in my note. But uh, it's amazing how people can patiently under the tough times and then lose their temper with someone. It is, it's, like, it's like that. You can be patient, but then if someone, you know, hurt you or uh, bother you or get on your nerves, something, you can lose your, your patience easy, easily with, with people while with 
circumstance like you have no control o- over that. So w- we see that. Another Bible version says, we ask him to strengthen you with his glorious might, with all the power you need to patiently endure everything with joy. And in that text here, with joy, I put it in parentheses here, because that word different to many, many Bible versions, it's like this joy is put at different place. It, sometimes the joy is associated with patience and long suffering with joy, uh, or, or the verse that will follow, mm. with joy, giving thanks to the Lord. We look at it uh, also in that. So it's either the joy has to do with this one, or it has to do with the next one. But joy is a very, very important uh, word here. Patience means endurance when circumstances are difficult. And it's a very important characteristic of the Christian life. And too many Christians quit too fast or easily. You don't like it. It's too difficult. It gets a bit heavy. Just quit. Just quit. But not the Christian because it says you will be empowered by all sorts. And, and there's another thing also about this. It is the all sorts of spiritual gifts that will be given to all sorts of power. So the Holy Spirit, when he works in your life, will give you some sorts of gifts according to what you need. Sometimes if it is uh, the gift to go through patiently into something, the Holy Spirit can do that. If it is to go through a people problem, he can do it. To sustain you joy and joy in the midst of trouble, the Holy Spirit can do that. It's not built in. It's not inborn. This kind of power, this kind of ability is not inborn. We need the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Amen? So that, that's why we need it. You see, also God, we l- read in the Bible, God is long-suffering toward people because of His love and grace. And long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. Moses was very patient during the contest with Pharaoh in Egypt. But he lost his temper with the people, you see? He was the most patient and the most humble and meek man. And he could, you know, be tough, you know, with the, 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 the toughness and the hardship of his role. But the people made him lose his temper. And that is often something that uh, the Apostle Paul is also a great example uh, for us because he, he is, the, we can see these qualities. In 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, you certainly know what I teach. You know how I live. You know my purpose in life. You know my faith. You know my patience, you know my love, and you know my endurance or my long suffering. So Paul had these qualities. But as all of us, sometimes we do display. There's a preacher that was uh, commenting on his, on his own uh, life. And he says, sometimes I have been really good and uh, maintaining joy and maintaining victory over hardship. And sometimes I fail miserably, miserably on, and do that. There's a pastor who visited a, a young man, a young Christian man who had been badly burned in his body. And the young man was, uh, had to stay in bed for hours. He could not move because of, of the burn on his body. And it was very difficult for him to do any even basic uh, functions in life. And one day when the pastor visited the, the young man, this man said, uh, this young man says, I wish God would do a miracle for me, that he would heal me. And the pastor told him, I have seen a miracle happening with you here. God has done a miracle because I have s- watched you grow and your experience with a lot of patience and humility and during these weeks. So God works with different types of, of power at different time. And another uh, very important statement, I think we will see it here. I, I put verse 11 to go into verse 12 to see the connections. 
to, and I put another Bible version here. Uh, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have all patience and endurance you need with joy. That is this one, that you may patiently endure everything with joy. And then I put the joy back into this verse according to certain Bible version and giving joyful thanks or, you know, being thankful to, to the Lord also. So beside patience and long suffering, to have joy, to show joyfulness and, and tough time is a big, big, big uh, quality uh, of the Christian life to seek. Someone was an evangelical, you know, the evangelical and the charismatic Christians sometimes uh, have a, a negative view of each other concerning the Holy Spirit or something. So this, evangelist, ev uh, this evangelical uh, pastor was talking about a charismatic friend of him. He says, I had a charismatic brother who when he faced any crisis would shout, Praise God, hallelujah, thank you Lord, amen. So he says, I, I gave him the nickname, Praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, amen. So that's how he talked about him. But then he says, as the time went by, and I saw this, 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 his life, I realized that he was just verbalizing what God had commanded in scriptures. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, amen. So his attitude was always uh, filled with joy and thanksgiving in his man. Can you say that this morning with me? Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's, let's try it one more time so that you can leave this room this morning. If you remember this only thing, remember this one. And all week you just go on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, let's practice it after the service. Okay. <laughs> Another evidence of God's power in our life is thankfulness. Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit will be joyful and thankful, even in, in, in tough time at times. And the epistle of Colossians is filled with thanksgiving. Amen. Years ago, in actually 1860 in the U.S., on September 8th, uh, there was a, a, a boat with passengers that rolled aside on Lake Michigan. And there was a Bible school student, his name was Edward Spencer, who personally rescued 17 people. And the effort that he, he gave into this to rescue all of these people left, uh, is held damaged permanently. And he was unable to complete his training in the ministry. He was a student in the Bible school, but after this experience, he could not even finish his Bible school uh, training. And he died not very, very long after that. And it was noted that not one of the person he had saved ever came back to say thank you. So there is thankfulness, and it is important, and it is a mark of the Holy Spirit to express it, to be, to be generous in our uh, commenting, praising, thanking people. And this can be practiced at home, husbands and wives, with children, with church mates, with colleagues, to be quick and to be generous and saying thank you, you really helped me, appreciate, and this kind of act, act, uh, thankfulness. Thankfulness is the opposite of selfishness. The selfish person says, I deserve it. It's mine. Other people ought to make me happy. So it's like the job of everybody else to, to minister to me. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm saying the same thing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm practicing. I'm practicing it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So I want uh, just to jump a little bit uh, further in this text here and see that verse 22 especially now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him however you must remain firmly established and steadfast in the in the faith without being moved from the hope of the gospel we can see that the book of colossians one of the things that i really appreciate about it's very gospel centered 
the message of the gospel is repeated. You believe in it. You, it gave you hope. Your faith comes of it. You keep on believing it. And because you believe it, you, you were saved. You were reconciled. So the, the, the gospel is really the center focus on that, uh, on that book here. Reconcile means to restore a right relationship or make peace that was broken before. And the goal that God has in mind for you and for me is that through the reconciliation of Jesus Christ. And that is so important. I think that, that's why I'm saying that when I go through Colossians, there's a lot of gems little text here and there that we just read through and miss. But this is like a big, big, big doctrine, the big truth right in front of us. The goal of God, the goal of the church, the goal of mission, the goal of uh, preaching the gospel, the necessity of doing that is to present you holy, without blemish and blameless before him so that when you will meet your maker there's no question about your salvation you are going to be with him for eternity there is think about it stop a moment like here we often you know preach talk about practical christian living and about things that you must do about uh, morality, about behavior, uh, you know, about character, about success, about uh, all sorts of things that are important for our life on earth. It's very important. But actually, all of this, we are on our journey to go to heaven. That's the center message of the gospel. Jesus Christ died. He came to die. For you and for me to reconcile, to take the enmity away, whatever separate me from God, to make sure that when my time comes, I'm going to be with God for eternity. And heaven and the new Jerusalem, whatever it is, however it is glorious to be in the presence of God. That's the point. That's the truth that we must keep on our mind to present you holy, without blemish and blameless. There is nothing as important as this in any book, in any movies, in any wisdom of this world, in any whatever it is. This is the goal of your life. This is where you and I must pay our attention. That is grace. Ungodly sinners can be delivered from their past sins and given that grace, to this assurance that is. Someone says, and Christ is found. A God who is near, who cares, who hears, and who saves. That's the kind of God that we have and that we encounter in the book of Colossians. And that text, you can see also a judge. God as a judge, because we were guilty before him, so we needed forgiveness and justification. He has given it to us. The judge has passed the verdict. We read it in chapter 2 of the book of Colossians. All the acts that were listed that condemned us has been nailed on the cross with him, and there is no more condemnation to convince you of sin. Because Christ took it all upon himself. You can see also God as a friend. We had a damaged relationship and we needed reconciliation. He's done that for us. And that's the kind of God we have. Amen? And in closing, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Do you do that? I mean, do you do that? Let me repeat it again. Do you do that? Let the word of Christ dwell in you a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes, when I feel, on Sunday only, richly teaching and exhorting one another with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with all grace in your hearts to God. That is so, so important. We need balance. 
in our Christian life. We, I'm going back to the beginning. Paul prays that you and I, we will know his perfect will so that we may start living a life worthy of him, so that we will be motivated to bear fruits in all sorts of ways. We will be creative and bearing fruit. We will seek opportunities to be involved in, the, in what God wants to do, so that w doing that, we keep on growing and practical and experience of knowing God. So we need balance. Reading the word of God and serving God and worship and service should not be in competition. Oh, I'm only a praying man. I'm only a worshiping man. Or I'm only a doer. I don't pray, but I do a lot of things for God. Or I only worship God, but I do nothing uh, practical to help. So it's two extremes that we should not be. Music is very important in this text, and I want to finish with music. Brother Chris, maybe you can start practice, uh, uh, preparing. Because it says, singing psalms, we exhort one another with wisdom through also singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, all with grace and your hearts with God. Music is a powerful medium of communication. It's very important because it enables us to express our feelings to God. This morning, you know, sometimes I, I, we look at each other, we're singing here. You can see face, you know, you can see like the, the mind is, is stretched out to God, is turned to God. You can see there is a, a joy, a release of emotions toward the Lord, which is very important. And y you can see the, the Christian concerts, you can see a lot of things. The influence of music sometimes is more important than the influence of the word in the church. In some case, people will follow these Christian artists to the end of the world. They will pay big money to go to see a show, but they will not be big money to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. So, so music is instructive, and music is designed by God. Realize that music is designed by God. You read in the book of Genesis already right after the, 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 the Cain is, is going away that one of the descendants of Cain is the one who uh, started the music. The, the Tubal, I think his name, started the first inst musical instruments. So already way down there the music uh, started. Music has always been an essential part of the church. Pliny, the name, a Roman governor, not many years after the death of Paul, reported to the Roman emperor, the Christians were in the habit of meeting before dawn to sing a hymn antiphonally to Christ as to a God. So they, they already at that time, and the very, very earliest part of the Christian church, this Roman governor is reporting that Christian before dawn, it's, uh, it's five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, they've already singing to the Lord as to a God. Spurgeon in his later years has, has a, had a big success, but went through horrible time because he spoke against some modernism and the doctrines of the church at some point. And uh, people came viciously to attack him. They undermined his character and it nearly killed him. And then he says, I would get by myself somewhere and sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, the Bible tells me so. And through some simple song like this, it would comfort his heart, make him feel. Music comes from the heart. Tertullian, an early church father, says, In our Christian meetings, we have plenty of songs, verses, sentences, and proverbs. After hand washing, each Christian is asked to stand forth and sing as best he can a hymn to, a go to God, either one of his own composing or one from the Holy Scripture. So that gives us uh, a glimpse in the time, in the church of the time, in the earliest time of, of the church. Hymns are sometimes compared to uh, praise vertically to God, and there are spiritual songs that express feelings, and Christian life and experience, which are horizontal uh, and, and nature, horizontal worship. I want to close with the story of seven Russians uh, prisoners 
by the Germans during World War II. They were taken to Finland and they were kept in a dungeon, seven of them, and they were to be executed. And the prisoners were cursing and swearing and they were beating their fists in the walls and, and their head, they were uh, desperate, they were crying for help for their families. Then one of the prisoners separated himself from the other prisoners and they, they knew their execution was coming. And then uh, he started to uh, home a tune that he had learned when he was a child from his mother. Safe in the arm of Jesus. And then he went by himself and he started to first hum him this, this song and then singing the words of this song. And then the other prisoners began one by one to ask him what he was singing. Then he told them that it came from his mother when he was young, that he had denied the faith. But his mother had taught him many hymns when he was, when he was young. And then he remembered this one. So one by one, they came and sat beside him and they asked him to teach them that song. And these men were going to die the Monday morning. And then they learned that song and the, their face began to glow and their fears went away and they were singing, all of them, safe in the arms of Jesus. One of the German guards told that story and he explained that the early morning when they let these men out to be executed, they left singing safe in the arms of Jesus. And they asked uh, not to have their hands tight and not to have a cover over their head when they were going to be executed. Because when they were executed, they were lifting their hands and s s looking up and singing safe in the arms of, of Jesus. Could it be that through this hymn, seven men were converted to Jesus Christ? And the German guard who recorded the incident wrote an article and the title of the article is seven men went singing into heaven music is important what we sing here we are so blessed in lighthouse here and people who come from different church and the u.s and europe well, always are blessed by the depth we sing hymns here we sing hymns that sometimes that bring you vertically into the presence of God. It declares the attributes of God, the character of God. And sometimes it brings joy and leads you to, to be, you know, uh, releasing. This morning we were singing a song. I was thinking, this is exactly what I'm talking about right now uh, in uh, some of the songs that we sang this morning. Whatever you do and whatever you say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So do it all for the glory of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks through him to God the Father. Amen.